Whenever we have a financial crisis or a recession or both, and we did in 2020, the economies change. We got a new set of rules. What's driving those new set of rules? When events happen, things change. And don't do like Jay Powell and talk about normalizing and pre-pandemic levels because he's arguing things don't change. There's just temporary blips and then we go back to the way things were. The Fed taking the funds rate from zero to five and a half percent has not broken anything that this level of interest rates this economy can handle. Although everybody thinks it can't and that the Fed has to lower rates, that real rates are too high, mortgage rates are making housing unaffordable. No, it can handle this level of rates. We haven't broken anything. Ultimately, it will either take higher interest rates or some other exogenous shock, an oil crisis, a political crisis, or something that we haven't foreseen that will break the economy. Welcome to the Microscopic Podcast presented by Gold Republic. My name is Alex Adronov and in this format I invite you to look at the world through different lenses to see what's hidden in plain sight. We'll dive deep to understand the forces that drive macroeconomics, financial markets and the emergence of a new monetary system with some money like gold, silver and digital assets like Bitcoin. We'll also investigate how geopolitics and power games shape the world we live in, but also what can we learn from history to understand the present and prepare for the future. I hope you will get fresh insight and enjoy this conversation. If you do, as always, please give it a like and subscribe, but also leave your actions down below in the comment section and share it to those who need to hear this. But before I start, I'd like you to know that if you open an account at Gold Republic, you will receive one free gram of gold. Just click on the link in the description. Jim, welcome to the Microscopic Podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Jim, as a first question, I traditionally always ask my guests uh, to uh, give a short introduction about themselves, especially if it's the first episode. So can you t tell us maybe a bit about yourself? Yeah, so I'm Jim Bianco. I'm president and founder of Bianco Research. It is a macro research firm that I, um, coming up on our um, 26th anniversary, which will be April 1st, you know, April 1st, 1998, uh, my firm started. Uh, I am affiliated with a small regional brokerage firm in the United States called Arbor Research and Trading. Uh, before 1998, I was actually the research director. They're still, to this day, they are still my uh, affiliated partner and I'm still an owner or part owner of uh, Arbor Research. Uh, we do macro research that is basically oriented towards um, the fixed income market and the economy, uh, the stock market. We dabble in a little bit of uh, politics. We tend to be a bit statistically or analytically oriented, put out a lot of charts and statistics on things that we, uh, we measure. And about three months ago, um, using my background basically in the bond market, we rolled out an ETF. Uh, you can find information about that at BiancoAdvisors.com. So BiancoResearch.com is our research site. Bianco Advisors is our ETF site. And the ticker on our ETF is WTBN. Our partner in that one is Wisdom Tree. So it's WT for Wisdom Tree, Bianco, Nancy, WTBN. Uh, and Bianco Advisors, you can find out more about it. And I'm also active on social media. You can find me on Bianco Research on Twitter or X or Jim Bianco on LinkedIn or Bianco Research on YouTube. Those are the places probably most active in social media. It's where I also found you. I gotta say you're in my top favorite uh, financial commentator and analyst experts in the field. Uh, you always say things that make a lot of sense, but also I always learn something when I read or hear you talk. Um, well, thank you. As you know, like they say, often wrong, but never in doubt. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the... Well, that, that's the traditional question I ask to every one of my guests is what is your most heretical view of the monetary system or on the monetary system? 
You know, the, that's a good question. I can answer it a couple of different ways, <clears throat> but I'll answer it this way. I think it's time for a change in the monetary system, um, both in terms of where we are in the cycle of being the 50th, 50th year, or actually longer now, 53 years of having uh, fiat currencies. But more to this point, um, I've been you know, also associated with being a proponent of crypto. And one of the reasons I'm a proponent of crypto is I'd like to say, okay, let's leave Europe and let's leave the United States out of the equation and even Japan, the developed world. They've got a monetary system that seems to work very well for them. There's billions of people in the rest of the world, and I'm thinking like the Middle East, Latin America, Africa, Southern Asia, that live under regimes of shaky currencies and corrupt financial systems. Uh, we in the West have had 150 years to bring them something better, and we haven't been able, we can't do it. We just can't do it. So the world is looking for an alternative, and I think crypto can provide that alternative if you start looking at it in those terms. The complaint I've had, the criticism I've had of crypto recently is, while that is a, a goal that everybody says, they're really more concerned about the casino and whether or not number go up and, and you know, just trying to make a quick buck off of it very fast uh, so that they can all buy a Lambo. And they've really lost the bigger picture of what they're trying to do. But that bigger picture, I think, is valid and it's necessary or as an old friend of mine liked to say, if crypto didn't exist, would we have to create it? And the answer is for 2 billion people in the world, the answer is yes, we would have to create it because they definitely need something like that. We're certainly not going to bring them the dollar as their currency, and we're not going to bring them JP Morgan Chase branches uh, you know, throughout Africa in Latin America in the Middle East and Asia. But uh, they're going to need they're going to need something, and what they have right now in a lot of those countries just doesn't work for them. What makes you think that um, crypto will be in one form or another? And in crypto, do you see like main currencies, cryptocurrencies? You see more Bitcoin and maybe some of the others like Ethereum, or like how, how does your picture look like? <clears throat> well, I think the big thing about crypto is the thing that scares the regulators in the developed world. It is decentralized and it is permissionless. So that if you own crypto in an electronic wallet, it, it, it can't be hacked. It, in crypto has not been hacked. Maybe some of the protocols have been. Um, it can't be hacked. It can't be stolen. They can't put rules on you. You could spend it on this, but you can't spend it on that. Uh, and that really is ultimately the, the promise of what would bring about a stable system. The beauty about a, a thing like Bitcoin with its hard cap of 21 million coins is it prevents a government or a central bank from trying to inflate away their problems and reducing the value of their currency. They cannot do it. The promise of something like a decentralized wallet is I can own my, um, I can own my wealth in an electronic wallet And they can't confiscate it from me. They can't take it from me. They can't steal it from me. Um, and so that's what is really needed. Now, now that I've said that, crypto's not there, but it can be there. It's moving in that direction. It's in, its, it's in early stages, kind of the buggy kind of promise of moving in that way. And I hope that they continue to move that way with that goal in mind. Because right now, like I said, it seems like people go, yeah, 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 that's the goal, that's the goal. But really what we really want is double levered options on Bitcoin ETF so I can buy it on Tuesday and make a lot of money by Thursday. But that's not going to get you to that goal if that's what you're really focusing your attention on. And too many people in the crypto space are focusing their attention on that kind of degen, that's short for degenerate gambling, that degen kind of uh, trading that goes on in crypto and not thinking about what is the actual mission of what crypto is trying to accomplish. So I bought into the mission and I still think that the mission is a good idea and I hope that they get back to it. And there are a fair number of people in the crypto space that would say, but we are doing exactly what you said and they are. And that's why I've got some hope that it can be something that can really be a benefit for everybody. Mm. Makes me think of this meme, I'm in it for the tech. I'm not sure if you know that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Exactly. I am in it for the tech, and I think the tech can be uh, very promising. Uh, and like I said, you know, if it didn't, if it didn't exist, would we need to create it? 
Yeah, well, if you live in the United States, you live in Europe. No, you probably don't need it. Uh, the euro, the European banking system, the dollar, the American banking system serves your needs fairly well. Uh, but like I said, for the rest of the world, especially when you start getting into emerging markets, uh, they need something. They need something else from uh, other. Ask anybody in Venezuela, ask anybody in Afghanistan, um, ask anybody in Nigeria, you know, um, that if, if something like this is needed and they will give you an, a resounding yes. If you go to the Greenwich Country Club or, you know, something like in Greenwich, Connecticut and ask those people, do we need something like this? They're resounding no because the current system treats them very well. And I understand, I understand where they're coming from, but, and I also understand where people say from Venezuela or Nigeria are coming from. And that's why it can be a very promising tool and it can be a very promising idea that the world needs. Mm. But um, uh, I also hear a lot of criticism, especially from the Bitcoin side that says, well, of the other coin, AKA shit coins, are yeah. basically replicating fiat uh, systems because they either have a very centralized uh, governance system where they can, through the means of foundations or other means, influence the network and just print money or censor or any other actions that can be taken, or don't have a cap on their, well, inflationary, um, well, po well, in terms of basically token economics, don't have a cap on the limit, like the limits of coins there, there can be. Um, and Bitcoin is, well, 21 million uh, Bitcoins right. and there's a cap to that. But I also heard you saying, well, Bitcoin is also being increasingly financialized. So the edge that it had until now being kind of outside of the system is now being taken away through an ETF, just like it happened now with gold. So one side, you want to make a better system that is not fiat based, which is kind of like the problem you're describing. On the mm -hmm. other hand, it kind of is replicating because it's all we know, but through different shapes and forms, which maybe through tech and usability might be different and more decentralized in some shape or another, but then still is not scalable, still is not working properly and so on and so forth. So I think when it comes to the crypto space, we need to kind of break it down into two sections, right? There's the coins and then there's the tokens. Um, there's only a handful of coins, Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, you, know, you know, are the two big ones that come to mind that are actual coins. Some of the stable coins, maybe um, Tether and Circle, you could throw into that camp. That those are the mediums of exchange or the stores of value, those coins, uh, those coins. Tokens, on the other hand, are very specific uses to represent either a trading tool or a representation of something like, an, um, like being part of a network or owning an NFT or something like that. It's kind of like somebody saying, you know, I bought a stock in the New York Stock Exchange and went out of business, so therefore the whole dollar system is, is junk. Well, a stock is not the dollar and a token is not a coin. So yes, there are thousands of tokens and there should be. And if the system works properly, there should be millions of tokens out there. Each one is a narrowly based purpose for that one token and it represents whatever value that narrow base is. Okay. Some of them are meme coins. Some of them might be you know, tokens in terms of getting fees generated on the Uniswap network or something like that. These are not the same thing as a coin, like a Bitcoin is, which is a medium of exchange or a representation of value. Uh, yes, a lot of these tokens have been poorly designed. Yes, a lot of these alternative blockchains have some <coughs> uh, decentralization problems, meaning they're too, central, they're too centralized. Yes, some of the tokenomics has been poorly constructed along the way, but this is part of the experiment to try and figure out what a new decentralized financial system will look like. We're not gonna get it right on the first go around. We're gonna have a lot of experiments and we're gonna try and, you know, trial and error our way into what seems to work the best. Mm. I, um, I can relate to that. I always see the, when I see the list of amount of cryptocurrencies, I equate every cryptocurrencies as an attempt for an experiment in monetary policy or a monetary system in a form and it might go bust and the market cap is basically the fluctuation of what is being funneled through in or not that believes or not be, or don't believe in that kind of crypto. And uh, there will be ones that rise and a lot of them, 99% would die. Just like, you know, uh, yes. And the thing that people need to understand, if you get into the tech, you can understand that the ability to create a token 
is five minutes of your time is all it really anybody could create a token for any reason um you know now that you've spun up a token does that mean it's going to have any value probably not unless people assign a value to it and we're willing to exchange some other token of value like ethereum um for your token but yeah these are these are experiments is, is what they are it's you know like i said Somebody experiments with a token, it doesn't work. They say the whole crypto space is out of, it, it doesn't work. Well, okay, down the block from me, somebody opened a restaurant and it closed a year later. So I guess nobody wants to eat at restaurants. Uh, you know, that's kind of the argument that you're using is that we trial and error with restaurants all the time to try and figure out what people want, where they want them, the types of food that they want until we get it right. This is kind of what cryptocurrencies are doing as well, too. So now go to because I also would like to go more into like your first principle, like operating thinking um, of the way you perceive things. And thereby, I would like to ask you, can you maybe span kind of a painting of in general, what are your first principles when you look at just in general, the um, plumbing of the financial and thereby like the monetary system as a whole? What are, what are you based on yourself? <laughs> so I guess to answer the question of first principles, you know, and I'll try and bring it into where I've been for the last couple of years. I think that the systems that we deal with are very dynamic. The economies that we deal with are very dynamic. Now that sounds like, you know, a trick phrase that everybody says, but they don't really believe it because they constantly revert back to the same set of rules over and over again. And, Whenever we have a financial crisis or a recession or both, and we did in 2020, the economies change. They always change coming out of it. They're different. Different, I say this all the time, different does not mean worse. Sometimes different can be better or sometimes it's just, it's gone from an apple to an orange and it's neither been better or worse, it's just different. And so when it changes, we need to recognize it's changed and we need to adjust our rules associated with that. So let me give you an example. I've argued, and this is more the case in the US than in Europe, that going in and coming out of the financial crisis, or I'm sorry, 2020 COVID shutdown, that we thought for a moment, literally four years ago to today, the day we're recording, you know, March, late March of 2020, we thought that the world economy was on the brink of a collapse. And then, the, U the U.S. government, actually all the developed world countries, started to engage in an unprecedented stimulus of, of, of sending out money, literally mailing money to everybody in the United States. And not just a little bit of money, but like multi-months worth of salaries to everybody in the U.S. to try and keep the economy going. And the perception is, maybe it's not a perception, it might even be reality, is it worked. We kind of we, we completely shut down the world economy. We completely restarted the world economy. We lost, I'll use US numbers, we lost 14 million jobs in March of 2020. And within two years, all those jobs came back. <clears throat> or at least the vast, vast majority of those jobs came back. And but and we said, okay, good. We 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 skirted that disaster. We had we were impending disaster, we avoided it. But the mistake everybody makes is, okay, what were the rules in 2019? And let's, let's now look for the economy to assume that type of trajectory, assume those rules again, and continue forward. No, coming out of 2020, things changed, and we need to adjust. Now, my first criticism is the person who really doesn't understand that things change is Jay Powell at the Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, and maybe a lot of other Federal Reserve officials, because they keep talking about the economy normalizing, returning to pre-pandemic levels, you know, uh, and what does that mean? That means that they think what happens in 2020, it just happened and it unhappened, and all those old rules are going to come back. No, we got a new set of rules. Okay, what's driving those new set of rules? I think it's the nature of work, that the nature of work has changed in the United States in ways that very few are really willing to accept or understand. And what I mean is, I mean remote work. Prior to 2020, the number of people that were remote working, and let's define remote working that you do some of your job not in a central office. Maybe it's one day a week, maybe it's half a day a week, maybe it's four days a week. 
was about four or five percent of the workforce in the United States was in some form of remote work. And that was rising by maybe half a percent a year. Well, here we are four years after the shutdown restart, and we're about 30 percent of the workforce is now some version of remote work. Two days at home, three days in the office, or 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 or, th or three days at home, two days in the office, or vice versa, or, or something along those lines. Now, that's an extraordinarily large number because by most estimates, about half the jobs in the United States cannot be done remotely. You know, you need to go to a you need to go to a central location to do it. A fireman can't be remote, a surgeon can't be remote, a waitress can't be remote, a carpenter cannot be remote, just to give you a, a couple of examples. But service sector jobs can be remote. And the majority of them now have some version of remote. Now, there's, a, there's, two, there's two thoughts about that. One, some people believe that it won't last, that it's, it's going to go away. It's now been four years. It's been fairly stable the last two years, the percentage of people that are remote. Now, why do I bring that up? Because let me use an example. Prior to the pandemic, you, if you worked full time in an office, you were home two days a week, Saturday and Sunday. Now with remote work, let's say you're home two days a week, Monday and Friday, and you're in the office Tuesday through Thursday, you've doubled the amount of time you're home. You're now home four days a week, you're not home two. What do I know about somebody who's home four days a week versus two, four years ago? Their lifestyle's changed. Their consumption basket changed. They are, they are demanding certain things they didn't, demanding less of other things that they did. And if we're going to be like Jay Powell and keep walking around going normalizing, returning to pre-pandemic, we're not recognizing that the consumption patterns have changed, the, the goods that we need to produce need to change. Uh, we're not recognizing that services need to change because now we need either less services or, or different services. And we're not recognizing that attitudes have started to change as well too. What's driving a lot of those attitudes is the nature of work. What we're finding post-pandemic is that when employers have made a big push to get people back to the office more, they either quit or are credibly threatened to quit and employers back off on those threats to bring people mm -hmm. back to the office. The ultimate example of that was last summer, the summer of 2023. The federal government in Washington, D.C., made a push to get federal employees back to the office four days a week. And so many of them either quit or threatened to quit or credibly threatened to quit, they backed off. And they're still at three days a week. That has had enormous changes in the labor market. So when I see economists talking about, well, the labor market is doing this and quit rates are doing that and the work week is doing this and the number of employed people is doing that, and then they make projections about what that means for growth and GDP and inflation. My first response is, you're still using the 2019 rules and it isn't working that way. It's working differently. And that's why I think we've been surprised by the higher wage growth and we've been surprised by the stickier inflation, even though you'll hear economists in the United States constantly looking at the data and saying, the labor market has to slow, the labor market has to slow, and it really isn't slowing. The final thought about the change in the labor market, um, the lower end of the labor market, maybe say the non-career path for, and that's a fair number of people. You know, they have a job, but they wouldn't consider it necessarily a career path. Those jobs have become a lot more transactional for a lot of those people. They'll take a job, they'll do the job. Um, and then when circumstances dictate, they'll quit the job and they'll go do something else and then they'll look for another job later. Prior to 2019, the social norm was you don't quit your job. You don't know what you're going to get next. And it says something about you that's negative. And but that's not the way it is anymore. So jobs are a lot more transactional as you know, the antidote I'll give you that I have a, an old college uh, friend who is the manager of several of the very large big box retailers in the United States. And he's been telling me, you know, that labor hoarding is a thing. And labor hoarding is when you have a good employee, you pay them extra because you don't want them to leave. Uh, and he's had problems with he's got labor, you know, he's got good employees. He pays them extra, gives them raises. 
And the one example he gave me in the fall, which people can understand is one day, one of his better employees quit. And he goes, why are you quitting? He said, because I'm big into skiing. I'm going to go to Colorado for the winter. And he goes, well, what are you going to do? He goes, well, in the spring, I'll look for another job. Maybe I'll come back and see if you need me again in the spring. And if not, I'll find another job. Prior to 2020, that was kind of verboten to think that way about the way that you would work. But now that's becoming, I wouldn't say it's commonplace, but it's becoming more commonplace as employees understand how their job has changed. This is really the driving factor behind how the U.S. economy has been performing post-2020. One of the things that it, I've argued is that if you look at the consumption numbers in the U.S., they're up a lot. The savings rate is down. The percentage of consumption that is part of GDP is up. We are buying more things. We are consuming more. Now, why is it that we're doing that? Two reasons. One, maybe it's PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, syndrome because of um, the shutdown restart. I'm going to live my life. I'm going to go take a trip to Amsterdam and Italy. I am going to buy a new car. I'm going to enjoy myself because this whole idea of being somewhat austere and trying to save as much as I can for a rainy day or um, uh, retirement isn't worth it. Because when things got bad in 2020, the government mailed me thousands of dollars. And I expect if things get bad again, they'll mail me thousands of dollars again. That's not an incorrect assumption on their part. So what am I going to do in the interim? I'm going to spend more money and I'm going to enjoy myself. So the economy in the U.S. has been way outperforming because of these higher consumption patterns that everybody says, no, this can't last. Um, well, it can for the entire cycle. We had, a sh we had a recession and a financial crisis coming out of it. We changed. Our attitudes about work changed. Our consumption patterns changed. We are consuming more in terms of even not only our consumption patterns changed. That is keeping our economy strong and that is keeping our inflation high. How long will that last? The entire cycle. It'll last until the next downturn. And then the next downturn, we will have another recession, maybe another financial crisis. We will see a bunch of stimulus inputs from that. And coming out of that, we will change again. Will that next change be, well, lower consumption patterns? Not if the government mails me even more money on the next downturn. I might go with no savings and just live my entire life paycheck to paycheck, knowing that they will just continue to spend and send me money. So, you know, first principles, big pictures. When events happen, things change. And don't do like Jay Powell and talk about normalizing and pre-pandemic levels because he's arguing things don't change. There's just temporary blips, and then we go back to the way things were. And I think if you start to recognize that things are changing, and they've changed for the entire cycle, that you it, things will start to make more sense to you. <laughs> uh, there's a lot to unpack in here. <laughs> yeah, I know. That, that could be a whole Lex Friedman uh, podcast right there, right? <laughs> That's when I come to Chicago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so actually talking about the labor shortage, because I think that's, a, that's an interesting one, because it also, I guess, ties to the inflation pressures and the inflation narrative that uh, is an on ongoing debacle, is uh, the, the shortage in the workforce. And there's a decrease in the core workforce. There's also just in general employers that do not meet uh, the... The, the talent expectations on, on, on flexibility, for example. There's uh, rising job uh, vacancy rates. Uh, there's also aging population. All of that feeds in and also technology gaps, like all kinds of, um, well, factors that do have an influence on that. And as you said, I think the, 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 the key moment is the moment that you, you stop being a waiter uh, uh, before like uh, the, the COVID crisis. And then you basically started having remote uh, customer support jobs because you needed to shift the way you worked. Right. And all that created those those gaps on, on the markets. Um, how do you see that as a whole then changing the, 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 the fabric of the economy then um, with respect to inflation? Well, it's going to change it in a lot of different ways because, you know, you still need waiters. And, and there's a very simple way to get a waiter is you got to pay, pay them more money. It, that's really all it is. It's just pay up for those for those those jobs. Um, 
you know, or offer some other kind of perk like remote work. One of the things about remote work too that people need to also understand is the studies have been done and it is true that remote work is not as productive as centralized work. So if you are working remotely, you are not as productive as if you were in a central location called an office with your coworkers. However, the cost savings of remote work is so much that it, off, it often compensates for that lost productivity. So give a little in lost productivity, get a lot back in that you can give back, you know, all kinds of floors and whole buildings that you don't need to house your workers. Companies better off with a remote work policy. But that loss of productivity can lead to being more inflationary. The other thing is all of this leads to a change in the consumption basket. One of the things I think we're learning is that the supply chains are very, very brittle. They're hard to change the supply chains. Mm. And that when problems arise, we have shortages and bottlenecks all over the place and that we see prices go up. And we saw that in 22 and 23. Now, goods prices, which is only about 25% of the economy, they're down and the goods inflation is around zero, but there's lots of evidence, either the Red Sea, the Panama Canal, um, you know, or other types of disruptions or changes in attitudes or tastes that supply chains are, harding, are, are, are finding difficult to meet that we're probably at a cyclical low in terms of goods, in terms of services. The story has been with services for the last four years is that the inflation rate on services has been high because um, there is a, the, 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 the change of services. We demand certain services. We want less types of services as well. That change in services is keeping service inflation up. And while everybody is saying it can't stay here, it's got to go down, it doesn't because they're still using the models and understanding of the economy pre-2020 as opposed to a post-21 economy. So I think that that leads to higher levels of inflation. And as I'm clear here, not 8, 10, or Zimbabwe levels of inflation, but more like 3 to 4% inflation, mainly around 3% inflation. Not the 2% that, say, the ECB and the, and the Federal Reserve are looking to target on inflation. The only way they can really get that is probably in a recession when demand is so weak that we could push inflation down to 2%. But without a recession, probably in a higher inflation world, and if we're in a higher inflation world, we're in a higher interest rate world. And I know that at least by the comments I've seen on Wall Street, a lot of people don't believe we're in a higher interest rate world. They think that interest rates are going to come down. The Federal Reserve has been talking about cutting interest rates. Uh, the, and I've been of the opinion that interest rates are going to be sticky. The Federal Reserve would like to cut interest rates, but I don't think at the end of the day, they're going to get the data that they really need or want to want to cut rates as aggressively as they would like. Mm. And um, also on, on, on that uh, uh, note, because you mentioned the, the cyclicalities of all that, where in the cycle are we? And you mentioned also the next recession, the next downturn. Where do you situate ourselves in the current macro setting? So I think we're somewhere in the middle. I am of, and the reason I say we're somewhere in the middle is I am of the Rudy Dornbush. He's a famous uh, economist who's, who said that recessions don't, you know, expansions don't die of old age, they're murdered. And so something comes along and breaks the economy and causes a recession. I am a firm believer of that. You've probably, or people listening have probably heard this in a different version, right? The Federal Reserve or the ECB raises rates too much and then interest rates go high and they break something and we have a recession. Yeah, that's a version of, you know, murdering the economy. And it's a very popular one. That one and a spike in energy prices, crude oil prices through a supply sh shortage spike, that's another way that we break the economy. I would argue that looking at the U.S. economy, and I'll stick with that for now, that the rise of rates that we've seen, the Fed taking the funds rate from zero to five and a half percent, has not broken anything. That this level of interest rates this economy can handle. 
although everybody thinks it can't and that the Fed has to lower rates, that real rates are too high, mortgage rates are, are uh, making housing unaffordable. Um, no, it can handle this level of rates. We haven't broken anything. Ultimately, it will either take higher interest rates or some other exogenous shock, an oil crisis, a political crisis, uh, or something that we haven't foreseen that will break the economy. So the, the, the track we're on, we will continue on. Um, I have a Bloomberg professional service on my desktop computer. And the way I like to say it is, you know, every day I will look at my Bloomberg and I've got the, 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 the little screw window for the hot breaking news. And, and if I see a big screaming red headline come across and I look at it and go, whoa, that changes things, then we could talk about whether or not we've broken the economy, we're going to have a recession. But we don't have that headline. And if I don't have that headline tomorrow and the next day and the next day, we just continue on. And that continue on means stickier inflation, higher growth, uh, pressure on inflation, pressure on interest rates, not to moderate as much as everybody thinks. If you look at um, those headlines, what possible headline could that be? You know, there's a couple of them. I mean, it could be um, it could be a geopolitical one about oil. It could be about war. That could be um, you know, war breaks a lot of things and could, could be very very inflationary. Look, it could be very political. It could be that one of the two presidential candidates in there, you know, both the oldest candidates we ever seen is one of them. And I'll say this. I'll say this politely. A red headline that says one of them is not going to be the is not going to be the president in November. That they're now no longer part of the equation. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's legal. Maybe it's a change of heart or something like that. I mean, those are the types of headlines um, that we could look. You know, that we could look at. A financial accident is always another one that you could be potentially um, you know thinking about as well. But usually, what happens is. An overlevered economy or, or some that doesn't break it. It just makes it vulnerable. Uh, the great analogy I've heard is the economy's expansion is like a pot of boiling water with the lid on it. Is it going to blow up? Probably not. But if you whack it with a hammer, you might see it blow up. And what these red headlines are is just whacking that pot of boiling water with a hammer. Maybe this one doesn't blow it up or that one doesn't blow it up or the third one doesn't blow it up. But the fourth one, when I hit it with the hammer, it blows up. And so that's what you want to say. So what I'm trying to say is the economy will not roll over on its own. Look at the last set of recessions um, that we've that we had. You know, COVID was was a whacking of, of the hammer and then blowing it up. Uh, you know, the, the, the housing market was we made an error in the housing market. And that, that was a whack of the hammer on the economy and blew that up. 9-11 before that was a whack on the hammer and blew that up. Before that was the Gulf War of 1991 was a whack on the hammer and blew that up. These are the things that cause recessions. Not that just, oh, it's seven or eight years and it's just old and it just, you know, kills over and dies of old age. It doesn't do that. So, for example, I've talked with uh, Alfonso Picatello, and in our episode, we were kind of like um, taking in, in little pieces about like the way bond markets work. And uh, one of the things we talked about was the yield curve inversion, obviously. And one of the things that uh, Alfonso was uh, was uh, talking about is that whenever there is a big lag. Uh, in the yield curve inversion, and it depends. It can also depend on which kind of yield curve inversion. It could be the 210, it could be the 1020, it can be like all kinds of ones, and we never know which one to look at. Is there's always a lag between eight and I think don't take me on that 24 months or something. It's kind of big, big span, and that in that time we might expect that something is going to go wrong and that we might expect a recession. Uh, do you think that this indicator is false or the, what's your usual uh, uh, view on that, that type of metric? So first, I do love Macro Alf and everybody should subscribe to him. He's a, he's a great read and a good thinker um, on, on the markets. Um, but the um, way I've looked at the yield curve in studying it, you know, is everybody knows that it's, you know, eight for eight in predicting recessions. Uh, the eighth one that it predicted was the yield curve inverted in the summer, fall of 2019, talking about the U.S., 
And then by early 2020, we were in recession. Now, of course, that was the COVID-induced recession. And you could ask the question, well, what would have happened if we never had COVID? And the answer is we don't know. We don't know what the counterfactual would have been. But we do know that it inverted and then we had a recession. Now, when I look at the curve, what I've kind of come to the conclusion of is it isn't when the yield curve inverts that is a signal by bond markets that we're going to have a recession. It's when the yield curve uninverts is the signal that we're going to have a recession. The issue has been that most of the yield curve inversions last a couple of months. So if you take the inversion date or the uninversion date, you kind of get the same answer. But when you have a very long inversion, we had some in the 70s, and we have one now, we're approaching two years now that the yield curve has been inverted on twos, tens, that it's going to be the uninversion date, whenever that happens, might, that might be the signal that we've broken something and that we are near a recession. Now, why is that? Two things. Most of the time, the way the curve uninverts, virtually all the time, is what we would call in the bond market a bull steepener. What does that mean? That means short rates are above long rates. And then what happens is the Fed cuts rates and short rates fall below long rates and uninvert the curve. So it's falling interest rates, falling short-term rates that uninverts the curve. Why are short-term rates falling? It's simple. The Fed is panicking. It sees a bunch of evidence that we're going to have a recession, and it starts cutting rates like mad to try and stop that recession. That uninverts the curve, and that is your signal of a recession. Like I said, in 2019, the curve inversion was 40 days. So if you measured the time from the inversion or the uninversion to the recession, you kind of get the same answer. So mm -hmm. I would argue that it is the uninversion of the yield curve that signals a recession, and whenever that may be, and most likely it will be because the Fed's cutting rates, maybe somewhat panicking like they did in 2020 or like they did in 2008 or like they did in 2001, that there's a recession coming and they got to try and stimulate to stop it. And they can't. And we have a recession anyway. So that's the way I've, I've, I've viewed the curve is that this, this period right now of uh, – of, of inversion is we're kind of in a holding tank to try and figure out what's going to happen next. It's when the uninversion occurs. Now, look, we've been inverted for two years. There's no reason that we can't go another two years with an inversion, or maybe next month we uninvert. But it will be whatever set of circumstances probably comes that says to the Fed, it's no longer debate about cutting rates. Should we or shouldn't we? What's the inflation level? It's, oh my God, did you see that red headline? We're going into a bad place. We got to start cutting interest rates mm -hmm. and we got to start cutting them right now. We're not there just yet. So talking about the Fed and I feel there's <clears throat> always a big, big chatter about like what the Fed is going to do. And it's kind of like the centerpiece of yeah, what people are watching. And I mean, the candid question is, why is it so that everybody cares about what the Fed does. Does the Fed really have so much power over the economy? I don't think they care about the Fed. Uh, and yeah, they have way too much power over the economy anyway. But I do think what they care about is the level of interest rates. And let me give you the example. So Dr. Jeremy Siegel wrote an update to his book, Stocks for the Long Run. <clears throat> um, a new edition is out, one of the best investment books ever written. And in that edition of Stocks for the Long Run, he poses the idea of what is the expected return of stocks going forward for many years, expected return. You should expect about an 8% return in stocks. And that, by all metrics and all understanding of financial markets, sounds like a reasonable thing. If you bought uh, um, an ETF of a broad-based index in the United States, like the S&P 500 or the Russell 3000 or something, you should expect about 8% a year. Okay, fine. If this was 2019, and I'll keep the example simple, and you had your money in a money market fund, most of the wealth managers or advisors that you would ask would say, Tina, there is no alternative. You can't sit around with zero interest rates when the expected return of the stock market is 8% a year. Yeah, it might have a bear market here or there, but hold on long enough and you'll, you'll even out to an 8% return. So mm -hmm. there is no alternative. You've got to push your money in. Okay, but in March of 2024, when we're recording, the average money market rate is 5.3% in the United States. 
That's 65 to 70% of the return of the stock market. And that is with a money market fund in the US that gives you a $1 NAV, $1 price every single day. No price risk at all. And you can get 65 to 70% of what you should expect from the stock market. Interest rates represent real competition to risk assets like stocks, like real estate, like corporate bonds and the like. And what the marketplace would like to see is less competition for those risky assets. Jay Powell cut interest rates. So I can scream Tina and I can tell everybody who's sitting in that $7 trillion in money market funds or in short-term bonds or some other relatively safe asset, you've got to do something else with your money other than sit there, push it back in. Now, of course, they're not going to go from a money market fund all the way to NVIDIA options, but they might go from a money market fund to a short-term bond fund, which is a little bit more risk. And the short-term bond fund guys might go to a total return bond fund. Total return bond funds might go to equities. Everybody shifts one to the right. And that, at the end of the line, pushes more money into risk assets. That's why I think the Fed matters. That's why I think interest rates matter as much as they do. So the argument I would give you is, you know, from 2010 to 2020, interest rates didn't matter. They were zero. They were staying at zero. There's nothing to look at. You got to just, you got to speculate somewhere else. But currently they do, they do matter. Now, where's that showing up? I think it's showing up in the concentration in the rally that we've seen in, in the equity market in the U.S. Now, there's no accepted metric. Is this the most concentrated rally since the 99 tech rally or the 70s nifty 50 rally or the or the the, the 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 TV stock rally of the late 1950s or something like that. We don't know. There's different metrics on that. But a couple of metrics for you. Uh, this is about a week old, but I don't think it's changed much. One of the popular ETFs in the United States is the QQQ, the NASDAQ 100. Half the return of that index, it's up 9%. See, you got to be in stocks because stocks go up a lot. And it's up 9%. 4.5% of that's NVIDIA. 4.5% of that's one stock. The other three stocks, Meta, Microsoft, and Amazon, actually have pushed that index up 9.5%. The other 96 stocks are down half a percent as a group. There's only enough money to push up four stocks. Same thing in the S&P. The Magnificent Seven companies are 30% of the S&P. They account for the vast majority of the return in the S&P. If you actually took those seven stocks out, the other 493 companies in the S&P, they're up 2% on the year. Now, this is about a week old, these numbers. Uh, if you look at mid-cap stocks, they're up like 1%. If you look at the Russell 2000 small-cap stocks, they're down on the year. The, the, the 3,000 largest companies in the United States are $53 trillion in market cap. That's 180% the size of GDP. There's not enough money to push them all up. There's only enough money to push up seven stocks, maybe a handful of others. Maybe gold comes along for the ride too. And a lot of really depressed stock markets that are way off their highs, like the Japanese stock markets recently made a new high. But the percentage of the Japanese stock market to its GDP is not what it was 30 years ago. It's much, much smaller. But we want all 3,000 stocks to go up. Well, how are we going to get all 3,000 stocks to go up? We need more liquidity. It would help if Jay cut interest rates. It would help if we could scream at the trillions of dollars that not in the stock market to get into the stock market to push everything else up. So my argument is that he's only got power because everybody's looking at interest rates. And interest rates do have power. And people are arguing interest rates don't matter. There's only two types of people that say that interest rates don't matter. Those that have been wrecked by interest rates and those that will get wrecked by interest rates. They always matter and they always will matter. They are the cost of money. The cost of money will always matter. It may not be an immediate mattering now, but keeps telling me that interest rates don't matter and say it long enough and you'll get wrecked by that idea. Arguably, you could say, I'm not worried about interest rates in March of 2024. Okay, fine. But there will be a time when they will matter. And so that they always do matter. So since we're on that uh, part, like also like a segue on to the last meeting that um, uh, the FOMC, uh, the Fed meeting, uh, I think it was a, a week ago. Um, the 
Jay Powell basically said that um, financial conditions uh, could be less restrictive, but there are data sets from the Fed itself that they actually just spun out. It's called the Federal Reserve's Financial Conditions Index that they've just, I think, made up, right? Like just a month ago, it's pretty fresh. It's a new way of measuring uh, the financial restrictiveness um, in, in the system. And uh, Fed Chair Powell is kind of going against that. Uh, he says that, well, we need to lose uh, loosen the financial restriction, and um, but they already lose, right? And uh, there's a whole debacle about is the Federal Reserve going to lower interest rates and cut those? And I think the predictions are up to three uh, by the end of the year. They might have changed yep. um, by now, but this is kind of the, the consensus so far. Um, and that's, as you said, that what before used to be kind of high interest rates, two to maybe 3% in the last decade, it wasn't actually the case before, but it is now perceived now as being way over like what we believe the system can actually take, which is a 5% range. Right. Um, well, how do you explain Powell's behavior and in, in that uh, Fed policy choice? Is it driven by elections? Is it why is he so dovish and also contrarian to kind of its loss of credibility? That's what a lot of people also commented on that, that he was dis like intellectually dishonest. Right. So let me take one of the last things you said first. Uh, Claudia Sam, who's a former Federal Reserve economist and does the stay at home macro blog, which is another good read, um, had coined a term that I've been using that the Fed is not partisan, but they are political. And what that, what I mean by that, not partisan, they don't sit around the table going, do we want Biden or Trump? And what policy would give us our preferred candidate? They do not do that. At least let's, I don't think they do that. I believe they don't do that. But political? Political means, of course, that they always worry about their reputation and where the narrative is with them in terms of the economy. And so that part, I do believe, matters to them, even though they try to say politics doesn't play any role. Yes, it does. You're not picking the winner, but politics does play a role in what they're trying, um, in what they're trying to do. So with that said, there is a valid argument to be made that he's being somewhat political in his statement there. But I think it's more to a more fundamental thing. What is the neutral level of interest rates? Now, the neutral level of interest rates is not an observable thing. It is a guess as to what is the level of interest rates that neither stimulates or restrains the economy. And economists put together sophisticated models and understanding and theories to try and understand where that level is. The Federal Reserve believes that that level is around 2.5% on the federal funds rate. How do they arrive at that? They believe that the long-run rate of inflation is 2%. And they believe that there should be a 50 basis point premium on top of that, hence 2.5%. So Jay Powell looks at a 5.5% funds rate, 300 basis points above that, which is a lot. And he concludes that they are restrictive, that that financial condition is restrictive and that he needs to start lowering that rate because it is too restrictive. Now, others, and I'll put myself in the others camp, think that, no, that the neutral rate might be closer to 4%, if not even above 4%. How to arrive at that? That the long-run inflation rate is not 2. That's what it was before the pandemic. It's 3. In the post-pandemic, higher consumption, you know, workers have more rights type of demands world, we have higher inflation. So it's more like 3 to start with. And that half a percent premium on top of that, it's more in certain world. It should be closer to 1%. So that gets you to a four-ish percent in neutral rate, maybe even a little bit more. Well, now that you look at a 5.5% funds rate in that environment, they're not nearly as restrictive as they think they are. And that even cutting three times might remove most of the restrictiveness. The stock market, you could argue, sees it that way. Hey, look, Jay, you're not that restrictive. We're okay. If you're going to give us cheap money, it is time to party and let's go. And that's what the stock market has been kind of reacting to. And interestingly, if you look at the bond market, 
since he made that statement, yeah, crypto's gone up, you know, party on, stocks have gone up, party on. The 10-year yield has gone nowhere during that period. Why? Because the 10-year yield's thinking, you know, I'm not so sure I like this idea. Because as I like to say, the 10-year yield in some respects is kind of is simple. If you're not committed to the inflation fight, I'm not committed to owning your 10-year note. So if you're going to back off on the inflation fight, goodbye to your 10-year notes and watch your yields go up. And that's why I, you know, I say this to all my friends about, well, Jay wants to cut rates because he wants so-and-so elected, Biden presumably. Well, be careful on that. You just can't cut rates on some random Tuesday and say, okay, everything's going to be good. If you cut rates and the bond market says, look, we still have inflation and you're not serious about it. I'm going to sell your bonds and watch. We'll be back at 5% in the 10-year note in a heartbeat, if not higher. And you've made it worse. You've not made it better. So I think it comes down to this argument about where is neutral. He thinks it's two and a half. I think I'm in the camp with a lot of people in the market. Maybe it's closer to four. And we're not nearly as restrictive as we are. And really, the big debate on two versus four, and that is a big difference when you start looking at these numbers, is the inflation rate. If you think the inflation rate is going to bottom somewhere ultimately long term, closer to three ish, then we're not nearly as restrictive as we are. And that's why the economy is handling it. And that's why we haven't broken anything. Uh, but if you believe, like Jay, that it is two and a half percent, then yeah, that's the level of financial conditions tightening. Because the Fed believes that a big part of financial conditions tightening is their own policy. And their own policy, they define it as being very restrictive. So if they cut rates and there's like, there's kind of a banana republic dynamic, right? If you then cut the rates and get the, the short term uh, also then uh, um, uh, steepening the yield curve and then the yields go high and then you might be probably doing yield curve control and then more QE, then eventually the dollar will also get beaten up, right? Yes. Now, you know, if you want an example of this, let's look back to just last year. July 26th was the last time the Fed hiked rates and they strongly con con um, communicated they're done. They're done now for a while. Oh, good. They're done. And everybody on Wall Street ran out these stories about, well, when the Fed's done raising rates, the next 90 days, stocks go up and bonds rally. What happened between July 26th and October, late October? The stock market went down 10%. It corrected 10%. And interest rates, the 10-year yield was at 390. And by late October, it was over 5%. So it all got worse after the Fed stopped raising rates. Why? Again, if you're not going to be serious about inflation, I'm not going to be serious about owning your 10-year note. 10-year yields. So you stopped raising rates, 10-year yields went up. And the stock market was reacting to interest rates. And it sold off at the same time. Let's contrast that to 22. In, tw in the summer of 2022, the inflation rate hit 9%. The Fed was raising rates 75 basis points a meeting. Why did the 10-year yield only peak at 422 when we had 9% inflation and the Fed raising rates 75 a meeting? And by the way, the day we're recording, we're still higher than that rate because the Fed was on the case. Yeah, we had 9% inflation, but man, they were going 75 a meeting. They're either going to break the economy or they're going to break inflation or they're going to break both. So I'm okay with holding a 10-year note in that, in that environment. So it's when you get more dovish, if the market perceives that the inflation problem is not really behind us, you make it worse. If you get more dovish, and you know, like I said, if the market perceives that the inflation problem is licked, there is no inflation. Jay, you don't have to cut three times. You could go all the way back to zero then at that point. You could go, you could cut rates as much as you want. If the market thinks cut them all you want, keep cutting them all day long because there is no inflation problem, then why stop with three? Let's go all the way back to zero. The reason you won't go back to zero and the reason you'll stop at three is precisely because everybody is worried that you could have an inflation problem. And do not underestimate an inflation problem. It is the scourge of any economy. It devalues your dollar. It devalues your standard of living. It does, and especially to people at the lower end of the income spectrum, it really, really hurts them. There's very few things you could do to an economy worse than 
putting more inflation on it. It is a devaluation of your currency and it makes everything relatively more expensive uh, than you would be otherwise. Why do we think that the president's approval rating is sold down? Because it takes $120 today to buy the same thing that it took $100 four years ago. And for people at the lower end of the income spectrum, that's devastating for them. And those are the ones that are expressing their displeasure in the president's low approval rating. And when the pollsters ask, why do you have such a poor opinion about the president? Inflation. Inflation is the number one reason why his approval rating is so low. So I know that there's a lot of people, especially people at the upper end of the spectrum, uh, income spectrum, about 2%, 3%, it's all rounding error stuff, doesn't matter. Yeah, because you own a bunch of stocks and you own a couple of homes and you have portfolios and they're all appreciating in value and you can handle the higher cost. But if you live on a fixed income and you don't have a portfolio of assets that you own, it is devastating for you. Uh, yeah, it's a silent theft actually of yeah. um, the invisible tax as we call it um yet so there's like this this whole dynamics that also what it does to assets and we you talked about gold as well gold is making new highs uh gold demand comes mainly from china uh central bank and the private sector uh, and it's skyrocketing and um so we've hit the all-time highs two times already in the past weeks there's two things a we have holdings of physical gold and ETFs that are declining, still declining. But, mm -hmm. and also on top of that, real interest rate that remain high. And yes, there's a whole discussion about if gold's price tends to be negatively correlated to real yields or not. But how do you, how do you explain those? Uh, so what happens if both of these trends uh, uh, return or turn? Yeah, so so taking um, the ETF one, you're right that the the holdings of gold in in all of the ETFs and GLD and IXU are the two biggest ones. I think that's like eighty percent of it. That peaked in like 2021, so it's been you know declining for like three years. That's not big relative to the size of the gold market. Actually, the crypto ET, the the Bitcoin ETFs, if you look at the effect of float. That's huge compared to the effect of float because 80% of Bitcoin is in wallets that haven't moved Bitcoin in a year. So its effect of float is like $300 billion. And if it's getting $4 billion a week into crypto, you know, into ETFs, that's why the price is taking off of cryptos. But the effect of float in the gold market is much, much bigger than that. And the, the size of these crypto, uh, excuse me, size of the gold ETFs is much smaller. So yeah, you've seen the investment flows trickle out via ETFs, but that's being more than overwhelmed by, as you mentioned, Asian demand, physical demand um, for, for gold. Maybe it's because the world has got two wars going on, you know, in the Middle East. Um, and in uh, Ukraine, and maybe it's because there's a billion plus people in China that are looking at an economy that's really in a bad place. And if you want to know a signal that an economy is in a bad place, when the Chinese authorities answer for their struggling economy and financial markets is print money, jail speculators, tell people that they can't produce negative brokerage reports and tell the rich that you got to stop wearing expensive watches or other displays of wealth because you're just going to upset poor people. You are completely out of ideas. You are completely run out of ideas if that's the way you're going to fix your economy. And that's what's happening in China. So you could see why the demand is coming for gold from a lot of those places. The world does not look safe to them and that they're demanding some kind of a store of wealth that will transcend borders and transcend time. And there's very few of them like there is with gold. So I understand um, um, that argument in light of what's happening with the ETF. The ETF, you know, to use my example again, I always like to use the Greenwich Country Club. That's Greenwich, Connecticut. I mean, you know, there's, there's poor people in Greenwich and they make like $3 million a year. And then there's average people in Greenwich and they make like $7 million a year. And then there's the people that belong to the Greenwich Country Club. You know, so that's what I'm talking about when I say the Greenwich Country Club people. You know, they don't want gold. They want, they want their money in NVIDIA or they want their money, you know, in the S&P index or something like that. So I could see why the gold ETFs are declining in, in that respect. 
But the demand from everywhere else gets back to our Bitcoin argument earlier about the world needs another type of financial system. Maybe the Greenwich Country Club doesn't need it, but the world needs it. And the world really could use it now. And they're using gold as a substitute for that other financial system. And that's where I think the demand is coming from uh, for gold right now and why it's been going higher. And this in the current circumstances where uh, we might even expect even losing our monetary policy if, let's say, there's uh, rate cuts and global liquidity that begins growing aggressively again as well. So It's not only looser monetary policy, it's also looser fiscal policy because mm -hmm. going back to what I said earlier, what happens if things go bad? What happens if I get that red headline and we break the economy and we're going into recession? What does the average American think is going, they, they were going to do in the next recession? We're going to take a slow walk to the mailbox and they're going to look for a big fat check from the government. And if it doesn't come today, they'll look tomorrow and they'll look the next day. And why will they do that? Because that's what they did the last time is what they did. Uh, and this time they will probably expect a bigger check than the one before. Like I said, do you blame them for thinking that? Because their behavior has been sown by previous behavior. And so that's why the answer might not be, well, if the world's unstable and stuff like that, maybe I should own the dollar. There will be a lot of people that will want to own the dollar, and I think the dollar will continue to appreciate in value. But they're also saying, well, if the world gets really bad, they're just going to print a ton of money, and they're going to borrow a ton of money, and they're going to mail it to everybody, and that's going to maybe cause more inflation. I understand that argument. Um, and even, in, even if that's right, the dollar still might be preferable to another fiat currency. So it might, it might rally relative to the other fiats, which I expect it would. But to a hard metric like, like gold, I can see why people would say in that environment, I should want to own some more gold. Yeah. And the fact that it's flowing out of the financial system, as we mentioned at the very beginning, and you also claim as the problem being with the Bitcoin ETF is that it financializes it, thereby it basically makes it prey to maybe manipula manipulation, but also legal implications that if the SEC uh, or whichever institution wants to ban Bitcoin, that this is all basically within a few clicks reach and all entrapped in those ETFs. Um, is that gold then basically, it's a good thing for gold then, if the ETF- Right, let me, let me, let me clear, you know, put some detail on what I meant by financialization. I've used the, the argument, of course, everybody knows, the, the crypto crowd knows, the gold card very well knows what, what happened when they closed the gold window in 34 and made it illegal. Uh, and the fear is that they will do that again in the future, and you've seen them start to do that with Bitcoin or with cryptocurrencies um, in general, making it illegal in various countries um, to own it. Well, the problem I've said is that gold best works outside the financial system. But when you start trading options and futures and derivatives and ETFs on it, you suck it into the financial system. Will they ban gold again in the future? I don't know, but I will tell you this. If everybody thinks that the way to own it is on a regulated ETF on the New York Stock Exchange, man, they made it really easy to ban it. They give, you know, with two strokes on a keyboard, there you go. Now your holdings are worth zero if that's what they want. But if you own it physically or in warehouse receipts in a foreign country or something like that, they could ban it. Just like Nigeria has banned the ownership of cryptocurrency and Nigeria is one of the largest owners of cryptocurrency. They can ban it, but they can't stop it. So if you're outside the financial system, they can ban it or they can put rules on it, but they can't stop it. But if you suck yourself into the financial system, you become part of it. And that's why I've also argued that one of the other problems that gold has had is by being sucked into the financial system, it effectively becomes another fiat. Is what, you know, and it goes up and down like the euro does. Uh, you know, opposite of the dollar. And that's one of the con con criticisms I've had of the Bitcoin ETF. You're so, you're, you've, you've built something outside the financial system. I went through that in the beginning about why it's such a great thing to have. But now you've sucked it into the financial system. You're turning it into another fiat is what you're doing. And that the only time it goes up is when the dollar goes down and vice versa. Well, I don't need that. I already got that. You know, you've not really given me anything new. So, that's what my concern about financialization is that, you know, because I've heard people say to me, literally say to me, you know, I think that bad things are going to happen and the world's going to be on fire. Okay, what are you doing about it? I own GLD. 
What do you think they're going to do to GLD if the world goes on fire? What do they think they're going to do to your holdings on GLD? They're going to put restrictions and they're going to put rules on it if they don't outright ban it. If your scenario is right, then you are not protecting yourself by owning GLD. You are protecting yourself by owning gold, but not in that form. And mm -hmm. that's the problem that the Bitcoin ETFers are also going to probably face as well, too. So now you, talk, you talked about the stimulus checks that have been sent. So this is the old way. This is the old check um, mailing system, all that. And there's CBDCs, on the other hand, that are being developed. And yes, Fed now in the US, there's a digital euro here in, in Europe uh, developed by the uh, uh, European Central Bank. And this is like a bit of a... Um, um, more metamorphosis into like this UBI kind of system, right? Where um, the government would be able to fin basically um, send you money and uh, because everybody's in distress, but thereby also creating more dependency on the government and thereby more control. And this is kind of like the narrative or kind of like the idea that a lot of people get from CBDCs. Uh, do you see it this way? Like that this is a, a way to basically force people into more and more this financial surveillance panopticon? Yes. Yeah. Let me be clear about a CD, CBDC. I think that I'm very worried that we are going to go down the road of a CBDC. I think they'd be nothing short of a disaster because they are not a financial instrument. They are a surveillance tool is what they are. You know, look no further than China. China when they rolled out the digital wand a couple of years ago, they sent everybody one to start using it. And then they put rules on it. Okay, you can only spend it on this. Uh, you, you, you've got, I'm going to put some digital money in your account, but you've got a certain number of days you could spend it. Oh, and by the way, I don't want you spending it on certain things. Like I don't want you buying alcohol with it, or I don't want you buying tobacco with it, or whatever the reasons are. And this is the problem with a CBDC. You are giving the government full authority to watch every purchase and, and expenditure you make and giving them full authority to censor or permission those, those purchases. Think back two years ago to the trucker strike in Ottawa, Canada. If you had a CB, if the Canadian government had a CBDC, Justin Trudeau would wave his hand and say, no one could give a penny to that, to the Canadian truckers, because we, the government, do not approve of their activity, even though it's perfectly legal what they were doing. Uh, maybe they were, they, maybe they were violating parking laws by parking their trucks incorrectly, and you could write them a parking ticket. And maybe they were violating sound laws by honking their horns in the middle of the night, and you could write them a sound ticket. But the the ability to uh, the ability to demonstrate in Ottawa was their right. And they then tried to crack down. And the government in Canada not only tried to crack down, but if you gave them money, which was legal, they then came back after the fact and said, now it's illegal and we will close your bank account and freeze your money. That will happen everywhere. You're too fat. You can't buy a sugary drink. You know, you know, um, you know you're too out of shape. You can't go buy cigarettes. They will put all kinds of rules on people in deciding where they can or cannot spend their money. And that's why I think that it is an extraordinarily dangerous tool, a CBDC, that I hope will never come to pass. And I don't believe governments when they say, well, we'll design it so we can't do that for now. And eventually you'll change it so that you can decide to do that. You've got anti-money anti -money laundering rules uh, uh, right now all over the place uh, that you are doing that is nothing but permissioning people right now with all their money. You can't withdraw $600 from the bank without the bank having to fill out a form to inform the federal government that you withdrew $600. And they're probably going to ask you what you want to do with it, asking, so in other words, you have to ask their permission to spend your own money. CBDC makes it much easier for them to do that. And I am totally against it. And I think that they would be a very, very bad idea. Now that I've said that, Unfortunately, I think we're going to get them. And I don't think that there's going to be any, any real pushback against giving them because I think most people don't view it like I do. And they're just going to view it as, oh, it's really simple. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, Apple Pay, but from the government. And I don't have to carry money around anymore. And I just wave my phone to pay anything I want to pay. And that's kind of the way they view it. And unfortunately, they're not looking at 
what come what strings attached come with that mm -hmm. and that's also like the case obviously for for bitcoin cryptocurrencies is to be its own and gold physical gold uh, its own sovereign financial uh, individual um in that sense also being able to do yeah escape this panopticon but for example now just recently uh the european uh parliament just voted a law on amla this new uh, anti-money laundering um directives that and there was been some misunderstanding on twitter on online spread around that unhosted wallets would be sanctioned on any transactions uh, first of all, it would be make it very difficult to track, even though like maybe we have the, with the rise of AI and so on and so forth, like technology that can ba basically do like on-chain analysis and tracking and so on and so forth. But um, I mean, even though that's not what it was meant, so now the, the, there's been clarification on the fact that uh, they will not punish unhosted wallet, but they will make it very difficult to let um, businesses uh, process payments and so on and so forth. But most of, most and foremost, any cash transaction be, be above ten thousand euros is is illegal. Um, is not possible. So now cash is kind of like the first frontier. Uh, you might say the next frontier is going to be crypto for sure until basically they will push down the throat uh, because of certain event. It can be any crisis as a headline, one of the headlines we talk about or any context, to then impose once the system is ready uh, on their citizens. Klaus Schwab, you will own nothing and you will be happy. You know, it's basically where they want to. He's the uh, founder of the World Economic Forum, who mm -hmm. famously said that a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, I mean that's ultimately where they're going to where they're going to go with it. And ultimately, you can look at it in one of two ways, right? You can look at it in well, of course, I don't want drug traffickers to get money, and I don't want sex traffickers to get money, uh, and the like. And nobody wants that. But the cost of doing it this way way outweighs the benefit because with the sovereignty of money and with the cre comes the creativity of a society too. I can do what I want with it because usually disruptive technologies usually upset people in the beginning. And usually the people that are upset are aligned with the government. And you're going to make it real simple. Oh, I'm going to create an Uber and I'm going to upset the, you know, I'm going to upset the taxi industry and the city of New York is going to go to the federal government and go, would you just ban that? Because we don't like that idea, you know, so that people can't use their CBDC to pay for that. You're going to create, you're going to kill creativity in a vibrant capitalist society with something like that. It will be abused because everything a government gets its hands on, ultimately it abuses it. And this will be no different than any other tool that you give them, that they will eventually abuse it. They might not abuse it day one, but they will eventually abuse it. And that's why I'm so so vehemently against such an, a product. Mm. I've also seen, uh, because you also give uh, some weekly, um, well, readings, uh, charts, also on biancaresearch.com. And one of the things, articles, and I think it was today, is that you mentioned that uh, Swift announced a CBDC development uh, that will make different CBDCs across, I think, 38 countries, if I'm not mistaken, um, interoperable and thereby um, cementing that type of financial panopticon. Yes. You know, uh, last week, Jay Powell at his press conference said, you know, we're just we're just engaged in a research experiment trying to understand CBDCs and see where it fits. And I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. He may think that. But the entire financial system and government apparatus around the world is building an architecture to have exactly that come into begin into being is a central bank digital currency. Um, and again, I can't emphasize enough. Every transaction you do will be monitored by the government or they will have the ability to monitor it. And every transaction you do, they'll have the ability to censor. Maybe, you know, you want to give money to a certain political candidate and they'll say, nope, nope, we don't allow that political candidate to get money. And so your CBDC will not, the transaction will not go through if you want to donate money to a certain political candidate. Uh, you know, you can just go on and on down the list of the way that they could censor that money. Now, again, I will emphasize again, they will tell you that they cannot or will not do that. But the temptation will be there to do exactly that. The mm. problem, the current system of cash and the banking system now, they can't do it because the system doesn't have that mechanism. 
but a CBDC does have that mechanism. And with that, with that power will become the ability to harness that power and then eventually to abuse that power. Hmm. So act, owning crypto and gold is an act of civil disobedience. Uh, we should yeah, it, it is, especially, you know, it's an act of civil disobedience, but I would argue you may not need it. You know, you, you may not need it in the Netherlands. You may not need it in the United States, that extreme act of civil disobedience of gold and crypto. But you do in Nigeria, you do in Venezuela, you do in Afghanistan, you do in the Ukraine. Um, you know, so there are places where it makes more sense. And that's why, like I said in the beginning, if it didn't exist, we'd have to create that product because the rest of the world needs it, even though we might not need it right away. Mm. On that note, uh, thanks a lot, Jim. It's been a packed uh, almost hour and a half. Uh, it's it's a, it's really a pleasure to to finally be able to talk to you. Yeah. Um, Thank you, and uh, <laughs> thanks everybody for listening. Uh, on the last note, I've actually came up with a, a concept that inspired from another show. Is uh, you might choose one question for my next guest. Okay. Do you tell anything. me who your next guest is? I cannot tell you. Oh, okay. So I have to choose a question for your next guest, but not know who your next guest exactly. is, but know that it will be a financially oriented um, person, right? Exactly. Give me um, anything. I, I'll ask. I'll ask you to ask them. My question that are my you know first principles answer from the beginning. How much do you think the COVID shutdown restart of the economy in 2020 permanently changed things? Okay, great. Noted. Thank you, Jim. Um, Thank you. I hope to, uh, to talk to you in, uh, in the coming times and uh, keep up the great work you're doing for the community. Thank you very much. I appreciate the conversation. Thanks for watching. If you liked this episode, give it a like and don't forget to subscribe. Leave your actions down below in the comment section. And if you want to watch more videos, feel free to check the most recent video, but also any other video that we've had published on the channel before. See you next time. Thank you.